I always wish that I had about three days rather than three minutes times 10, right? Because there's, ah, there we go. There's absolutely no way that I could actually give you really good, solid information in 30 minutes on coding. Um, I am an ex-New Yorker, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can and get in my New York mode so that I can actually give you more information maybe than, than less. Um, I have a disclaimer only in that, especially in today's world, I think the re I know the reimbursement world is changing, which means your coding and documentation requirements and what you need to make sure you capture is also changing. So if something, especially when it comes to the new quality payment programs in Medicare and all other payers, um, moves forward, please remember that it is an evolving process and some of the things I say today may no longer be valid or be incomplete in another three to six months. All right, I'm going to go over some of the payer documentation requirements, medical necessity, rheumatologist being that cognitive specialty, obviously provide a lot of evaluation and management, office visits, so to give you some of the basics as to OK, what the heck is in a level four office visit is probably important. Um, and because I'm not a physician, nor a nurse, but I have stayed in a Holiday Inn Express, I love this little slide because it kind of puts my perspe perspective in perspective. So these 10 iron rules of Medicare, I've been using these for, I guess, about 17 years now. They never grow old. But this is why I'm talking to you this morning. Just because it has a code doesn't mean it's covered. Just because it's covered doesn't mean you can bill for it. Just because you can bill for it doesn't mean you'll get paid. And number four is my all-time favorite and the most dangerous for you in private practice, regardless of where you go. Just because you've been paid doesn't mean you can keep the money. So understanding what you need to document from a payer perspective and keeping that in mind um, is, and learning it and knowing it and doing it intuitively is really important. Because just, and also, just because you've been paid once doesn't mean you'll get paid again. Boy, do I wish doctors would never speak to themselves about coding. I can't tell you how many times in my professional career I've had a physician say, Gene, I don't understand why Cigna, Blue Shield, Medicare, or fill in the blank, is asking me for money back. They've been paying me this for years, right? That is not a guarantee of payment. It only means that you build a code that is a covered service. Whether or not you actually should have been paid for it because your documentation supports it, that's another story. Also, um, just because you've been paid in one state doesn't mean you get paid in another. Someone also today already mentioned um, national coverage determinations and local coverage determinations, I think, and the Medicare administrative contractors get to create some of their own rules. And a service that might be covered in, say, Maryland may have different criteria for coverage in my home's my state of Florida. Um, and yet, you'll never know all the rules. And then, of course, the downside is not, not knowing the rules can land you in the slammer. And yet, there's always some shlemiel who doesn't get the message. And I'm a nice Gentile girl, so I didn't know what a heck a schmendrick was. But so a physician Fred told me once that, Gene, in the politest terms, it's a jerk. So there's always some jerk who gets the message and ignores it. And since I'm from South Florida, which is indeed the the uh, fraud capital of the world. In fact, I usually tell folks in other states, whatever you've heard about the fraud in South Florida, triple it, and you may be somewhere near what it really is, right? All right, so hopefully that sets the tone as to where I'm coming from today. So what about those payers, since that's my main um, perspective for you all this morning? This comes from, the next couple of slides are taken from the Office of the Inspector General's Physician Compliance Guidance. And one of the things you really need to consider in private practice is whether or not you have a compliance program. Some practices have them. Some practices have them formally. Some practices have them informally. And the informal is that because the corporate culture is that we're just going to do the right things right, right. And that's probably the most important because having a compliance program on a shelf somewhere in a manager's office that somebody might be able to find that has dust on it is actually more dangerous than having a good uh, culture of compliance. Every record needs to be complete and legible. Uh, one of the upsides for someone like myself who does a lot of chart audits to the EMR era is the fact that the legibility issues for me go away. And they go away for the payers as well. Um, document the reason for the encounter. This is something I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth. I like to say that that's also known as medical necessity. 
And if you think about it, whether it's Medicare, Blue Shield, Aetna, Cigna, doesn't matter, these are insurance companies. And they have certain um, services and items that they cover and certain items and services that they don't cover. And for those things that are covered, certain circumstances must be met, right? So, and having, to, and having those documented in your chart, that really is the medical necessity definition. Um, one of your best areas to bulletproof your records for um, any type of a payer audit is to have a well-documented history of present illness, impression, and plan. I, I'm one that likes to say some of the other stuff in the middle, a good nurse could do. Heck, a good nurse can do a review of systems, take past family social history. In fact, if she's well-trained, she could probably do a decent physical exam. So all these years that you've spent in training, it's really getting out of the patient what the heck has been going on and what was the sequence of events and symptoms, et cetera, and then how did you put that together and what are you gonna do about it? History of present illness, impression and plan, most important, I believe, from a clinical perspective. And make sure everything is signed. Um, it's really, really important. Unfortunately, the Medicare program, and most payers do follow the Medicare guidelines, have been since 2010 really hard on signatures. Um, and yes, in an EMR, if at the end of your progress note, at the end of your procedure note, it says electronically signed by fill in the blank, that does suffice. But please do make sure that it's signed. So what is this medical necessity thing that she mentioned? So the law that governs the Medicare program is the Social Security Act. The top paragraph, the quote, comes directly from that. So Medicare law requires that in order for expenses incurred for items or services to be covered, they must be reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of illness or injury or to improve the functioning of a malformed body member. Okay, I've already alluded to the fact that I do a chart audit or two. I have never seen a doctor de document anything about a malformed body member. So when I first found that, doc that uh, definition, I was like, okay, I need to find something that is actually in English that someone could understand. So I went to medicare.gov where the beneficiaries are supposed to go for information about the Medicare program, and there was a must, much more descriptive and understandable definition. Services or supplies that are proper and needed for the diagnosis or treatment of your medical condition are provided for the diagnosis, direct care, and treatment of your medical condition, meet the standards of good medical practice in the local area, and aren't mainly for the convenience of you or your doctor. Okay, so that makes some sense. And that's a real good definition of medical necessity. And in the Medicare program, except for certain services like an annual wellness visit, screening mammograms, screening PSA, um, that are under the screening and preventive services benefit, that's really what you have to consider for any of your office visits, your injection procedures, your x-ray, your bone densities. Do they meet the test of medical necessity? Um, and like I would said, think about Medicare or anything else as insurance. The services that are covered, you need to have documented what those coverage criteria are. So one of the things that you need to make sure when you're in private practice, regardless of the setting, is what are the services that you provide that there is an LCD for, that there is an NCD. Most states have policies, the Medicare programs, local coverage determinations for your visco supplementation, for your infusible and injectable drugs, most of them do as well. This is something you do yourself a big favor as to becoming familiar wherever it is that you, the young ladies and gentlemen in the room land. Okay, so some basics on evaluation and management. And um, I'm gonna start from the beginning because I don't know the settings that you're gonna wind up practicing in, so I think it's kind of important. This is the most confusing aspect of documentation and coding that I have ever seen. And if you think about it, if you've ever handled a CPT code book, all the codes are in numerical order, except for e and codes. They start with 99, would think they would be in the back of the book. Oh no, they're up front. And they have a fairly thick set of introductory guidelines. And then on top of that, the government has created two other sets of documentation guidelines that you can choose for the more detailed. And there are people like me, plenty of us, that go around the country lecturing on evaluation and management. Have you ever seen that happen with like an orthocentesis or anything? No, so this is a complex area. So to be able to code correctly, you first have to figure out where am I? Because there are different codes for the office, there are different codes for the inpatient setting in the hospital. 
you happen to see a patient in the outpatient department of a hospital, there are different codes for that. If you were to see a patient at home, there'd be different codes for that, et cetera. And in your outpatient setting, you have to understand what is a new patient and an established patient. And because many of you will be joining an established practice where you'll be seeing patients that have been seen by one of your colleagues, um, I'm going to give you that definition so it, because it's important. If you should have any type of a hospital-based program, which I understand is not common for rheumatologists, but just say that one of your patients goes in the hospital, that new patient and established patient definition and concept doesn't exist. You could have seen me yesterday in your office, something flares horrifically and I am admit, admitted to the hospital and you see me tomorrow, that's an initial hospital visit. It has nothing to do with whether or not I'm a new patient. So once you've figured out where you are, is it a new patient or an established patient, then you can figure out the different levels of service. And this also isn't easy. There are three levels of service for some CPT codes for E&M. Others have four, others have five. There's no one-to-one -one correlation. So here's this definition of a new patient and an established patient, straight from the CPT code book. Solely for the purposes of distinguishing between new and established patients, professional services are those face-to-face -face service rendered um, by physicians or other qualified healthcare pro professionals. So an established patient is one who has received professional services from the physician or from a physician of the same specialty in that group, i.e. tax ID number, for that patient within the past three years. So when you join a new practice, even if it's the first time you're seeing a patient and you may indeed want to get more information on that patient than your colleague did three months ago when she saw the patient because it's the first time for you, know that that's an established patient because the patient's been seen by someone else in the practice before. Let's just say that that first decision doesn't work out, so you move to another practice five miles away, outside your non-compete. And some of your patients follow you. The first time you see them in this new practice, under this new tax ID, is it a new patient or established patient? It's an established patient, because an established patient is the one who has seen you or someone of your specialty in your group in the past three years. So if they follow you, it's still an, um, an established patient. And you understand why I wanted to tell you that, because of number four in my 10 iron rules of Medicare, just because you've been paid doesn't mean you can keep the money. And one of the things that I always find interesting is how many edits that we would expect that existed in a payer's claims adjudication process that do not exist. So you would expect that if you'd build a new patient visit for me within the last three years, that if you build another, you'd be denied, <laughs> you'd be wrong, right, in most cases. All right, so you've decided where you are, new patient, established patient, you know that. How do you pick those levels? So I like to say that there are two distinct ways to do that. One is following the, key, the three key components. How much history, physical exam, medical decision making did you perform or document? regardless of how much time it took you, because when you're in practice for a while, you'll do a 99214 that, I want enough 99214s to make a decent living, but not so much of the payers single me out um, code. You'll realize that you can probably do that in about 10 minutes. The fact that that code has 25 minutes attached to it in the CPT code book is immaterial. It's all about the complexity. The second way to choose the code is based on time. How much time did you spend with that patient in the office, face to face, if and only if more than half of that time was spent by you in counseling or coordination of care with the patient? Then, I'm not telling you not to examine your patients by any means, but you don't even need to do a physical exam, right? Um, there's no requirement because now you're choosing the level of E&M service based on your total time and the fact that more than half of that was spent in counseling. I typically call it the results visit, and I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So here's the rule. A visit, if a visit consists predominantly of counseling or coordination of care, time is the key element to assign the appropriate level of E&M service. It's face-to-face -face time, you and the patient, not staff time, et cetera. Um, you can estimate the total time if you were with the patient 27 minutes. You don't have to say 27 minutes. It'd be 25 or almost 30 minutes. Um, but you can't round up, so what do I mean by that? In CPT, let's see, ah, 
99214 has a typical time attached to it of 25 minutes. 99215, and these are established patient office visits, 40 minutes. So a 35 minute visit is still a 99214 because you cannot round up. That's all that means. So here's a visit. At least 45 minutes with the patient more than 50% discussing lab results, lifestyle changes, and medications to help manage symptoms, new diagnosis of lupus. All patient questions answered, long discussion regarding her desire to get pregnant. That is a 99215. Now, I don't think you're going to have too many of them, but this is a facetious example. But in all honesty, the amount of minutes was, that was spent um, is documented. 99215 has 40 minutes attached. More than half the time was spent on counseling. Um, and exactly what was discussed is documented. That's it. So no physical exam, review of systems required. Again, I'm not saying not to do that, right? You do what's clinically pertinent at a, at a given encounter, but from a billing and coding perspective, that actually is a, is a billable encounter. All right, but that's not gonna happen every day. It's not gonna happen every week. The bread and butter for you guys choosing your ENM codes is the three components. So let's look at those quickly. First one is the history. First of all, every patient needs to have a chief complaint. Now. I know you learn in medical school that that's how the patient says they're feeling in their own world, words. So I see a lot of chief complaints that patient is without complaint. Well, from a payer perspective, the Medicare, Cigna, Blues, et cetera, is going to want to know then why the heck are you seeing the patient, right? Yet you may not have met the medical necessity uh, test. Or I'll see a note, whether it's handwritten or in the EMR, chief complaint, colon, F slash U. Now, I know somebody's not being fresh with me when I see that, right? But follow-up in itself is not the reason for the encounter. It's follow-up of what? Follow-up of OA, follow-up RA, whatever it might be, right? And that's perfectly fine. Then the history of present illness, review of systems, and whether or not past family and or social history are documented. Um, and that chief complaint can be explicit, knee pain, or it can be implied, doing well since adding Ultram. The inference there would be you're following up with the patient because you added a new drug to their regimen and you want to make sure that it's working or not so you know what to do next. Both of those are acceptable chief complaints. <clears throat> History of present illness, you've got the list there. Let me see if I remembered one. No, I I'm always seem to be forgetting to put context in there, which is another one. One of the things that I know about rheumatologists is you this is a specialty that does a great history of present illness, whether it be that initial one or interval when you're seeing the patient in follow-up. From a coding perspective, you never need more than four of these elements, even for the highest code possible. In your specialty, because of the nature of what you do, you always have location, quality, severity, modifying factors, associated signs and symptoms, and sometimes much, much more than that. So you don't even really have to give this much thought if you're a decent documenter. Review of systems, I like to remind physicians, is a series of questions about past or present symptoms. It is not chronic conditions. So under cardiovascular and the review of systems, it is not a review of systems if you said no hypertension, no CAD. It would be a review of systems if you'd said no chest pain, uh, no palpitations, but it is a uh, series of questions that answers about past or present symptoms, right? So here's a list of 14 approved systems from the Evaluation and Management Documentation Guidelines. And the most any code rep, uh, requires is 10. I also see, because of the multisystemic nature of the diseases that you see, on new patients, 99, probably 0.9 percent of rheumatologists not, not only have 10, but have 12 or all 14 systems documented because you need to go on a fact-finding mission, right, to try to figure out what's going on with the patient when you first see them. So again, you're in a specialty that a lot of these things come pretty naturally. Um, the guidelines state that a complete review of systems addresses the system related to the problem plus all additional body systems. They go on to say, however, that at least 10 must be reviewed regardless of the fact that I just showed you a list of 14, so how could 10 be all? But hey, these guidelines were written, written by the government, 
And as another uh, speaker's slide said, hi, hey, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Um, obviously those with positive and pertinent negative findings must all be documented. But if you've asked, say, six, seven, eight systems and you, you've gotten down your positives, the pertinent negatives, and the next two, three, four systems you've asked, they're all negative and they're really not that pertinent. The, I don't like it, but the guidelines actually state this, so it's only fair that I tell you, you can state all of the systems negative. Now, I'm sure some of you in your training have seen your attendings document a complete 14-point review of systems is negative. Okay. So as long as there actually are positives and pertinent negatives, that's acceptable. Um, please don't get into the habit of documenting something along the lines of in the review of systems um, um, as per the HPI. Because an auditor, whether it's me or someone for the payer, the first thing they're going to do then is go to the history of present illness and look for responses that were to questions about a review of systems. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone back up there and what I find is the chronology of events as far as when a patient became symptomatic or their test results, et cetera, but very little, if any, actual review of systems. Right? So some, some things to watch out for. Past family and social history, they kind of speak for themselves, although I would remind you that family history is not, uh, not documented if all you say is parents deceased. It's supposed to be about medical events that might impact the patient. Um, obviously, if a patient is adopted, one can say that because then the family history is unknown, right? And if your family history that has been asked by yourself or your nurse is indeed negative for your purposes, please say something along the lines of no known rheumatologic disease or whatever it is you think you're working up on this particular patient and avoid terms such as non-contributory. Some of the payers look at that term non-contributory as meaning that the history element was non-contributory to you, so you did not ask about it, right? So you're better off never using that term. What are the general guidelines for the history? Should the extent of the history, that history of present illness, review of systems, whether or not you ask about past family and social history, should be dependent on your clinical judgment and the patient's presenting problems. They can all be listed in nice little headings, and that of course makes it easier for someone else who's reading your note from a coding perspective, internally or the externally or a payer, but there is no requirement for that. Um, I actually brought some records with me for a client to be reviewing while I was here this week, and I was noticing that um, some of the elements that I needed for medical decision making were in this clinician's history, and I was counting them from there. It didn't matter where they were. Um, you do not have to document the complete review of systems as far as independently asking those questions each time. If the patient's been seen before and those history elements are elsewhere in the record, the documentation guidelines allow you to reference those and whether or not there are any changes. So it might be something like this if I've been seen fairly recently. No changes from review of systems um, uh, from, where are we, February, from January 17th, 2017. Right, as long as it's clear to the reviewer where they could find the history element that you're referencing, it actually counts as if you quote unquote did it again today. And then from a coding perspective, since I'd mentioned that depending on how much history you document determines the, helps to determine the code, a 99204 and 99205 for a new patient requires a comprehensive history Everything in this line needs to be there. If you had family history non-contributory and you had a very complex patient, the payer looks at it because they were, they're not gonna count that. At best, you'd have a detailed history which might bump your level four or five new patient or consult code down to a level three. So it's really important. Physical exam. Now here I need to tell you of the two sets of guidelines that the CMS has put out that I mentioned. I'm I'm talking about one, 1995. You may in your training have been taught to 97, two elements from at least nine body, uh, organ systems. I've not seen rheumatologists that actually document well from a comprehensive exam perspective for 97, so I'm only gonna talk 95. That's perfectly fine. CMS has actually said whichever one most benefits the physician. One of the few times doctors rule in the coding world. 
So the important thing about the exam is to recognize we have body areas and organ systems. And why is that important? Because a comprehensive exam in um, Evaluation and Management 95 is an exam of eight or more organ systems. So I always ask physicians to look at that list of organ systems, think of what you document and perform when you do what in your mind is a complete exam, and do you have at least eight organ systems? Forget the body areas for a moment. Eight organ systems that you examine and document. If so, you're spot on already for a comprehensive exam. If not, think about what you might be examining and not documenting, such as eyes, perla, right? I mean, if you're standing in the room with the patient, you, you're already evaluating that, you may or may not be documenting it. What about if they have an appropriate affect or alert and oriented times three? Are you documenting psych? You're evaluating it, right? So think about that so that you capture at least those eight. The exam has the same four levels. Comprehensive exam, again, is that level four or five office visit. A level four office visit, an established patient, that 99214, is only a detailed exam. And here, because of the nature of your specialty, I can't remember the last time that I saw a rheumatologist office visit note that didn't have at least a detailed exam, because that's just an extended exam of at least two body areas or two organ systems, sometimes more depending on the state. Where Dr. Bariff comes from, his Medicare carrier, Novitas, has their four by four system, which says that a detailed exam is when the physician documents at least four elements from at least four body areas or four elements from at least four organ systems. Hence, my, I'm one of my bullets on the 10 iron rules of Medicare as to just because you got paid in one state doesn't mean you get paid in another. So you have to make sure you understand the rules, but that's not a big exam. Um, a detailed exam, if you documented in most states, an extended exam of both upper extremities or both lower extremities, that's two body areas, that's it. So for rheumatologists, again, easy to get to. And I keep saying these types of things because you've got to know that in your specialty, to have a higher level of code is not unusual at all by any means. So new patient office visits, level three. Level three office consults, 99243. Don't be fooled that, that nobody pays for consultations anymore. It's not true. The Medicare program doesn't. Some, Humana typically doesn't. Most of the Blues still do. There are Cigna still does. There are a lot of payers that still pay for consultations. And there's a huge payment differential. You can see everything that would be required. One thing missing, you don't even have a level three. Um, level three established patient office visit is almost nothing. One, two, or three elements of a history of present illness, one review of systems, a brief exam of two body areas or organ systems, medical decision making of low complexity, which would be two very stable problems, no medication changes or anything. Your level four new patient and office consult has to have everything here. What would a level four be? New problem with or without a workup and prescription drug management. If you had that in a comprehensive exam, comprehensive history, you've automatically got a level four new patient office visit or with the right documentation consultation. That 99214, two of these three key components now need to be met. Your history of present illness, you're gonna get at least two systems. You're always gonna review the medication. Let's ass assume the physical exam doesn't meet it. Medical decision making, three stable chronic conditions, you're done for a 99214. So that's why it's such a common code. The level five new patient difference has to be with complexity. And this is where my wish for like six hours come into play. Um, the next thing you have is a list of errors. Um, be careful with electronic medical records, with carry forwards. That would be my biggest message to you. Um, make sure that the templates aren't hanging you with uh, documentation. Denies erectile dysfunction is a term I've seen in female charts, right? So clearly, you know, forget the coding. I know that you'll have a good attorney talking about medical professional liability later today. If you're on the stand, and somebody asks you, doctor, did you really ask Ms. Acevedo about her erectile dysfunction? You have no good answer, right? So be careful about those things. And then, um, I know you're having a talk on this, on MIPS. I just need to say one thing. 
Diagnosis coding has never been more important than it is today. There's a cost component in this, and the only way the Medicare program knows or the other payers how to project costs for their insureds is based on your diagnoses. So when you see a patient for, say, OA of the knee and you inject them with Depamedrol or another steroid and they have diabetes and you've advised them to monitor their blood sugars, code that comorbidity. So I think that's, yeah. And you can read the rest. Thank you.